we want to make sure we focus on both transformative capabilities that may take a little bit longer to materialize and at the same time also quick wins so that we show that value and gain momentum and once you gain momentum you gain champions and once you gain champions you gain a following it becomes a movement throughout the enterprise and you no longer have to do it yourself you do it together as a whole company welcome to the data chief the data chief is a podcast for data and analytics leaders to share their personal stories and insights on technology culture and leadership your data will never be clean and it will never be perfect so how do we create meaningful models anyway as katia walsh puts it data leaders are facing a tsunami of data but that tsunami shouldn't stop you from testing, iterating, and moving quickly. Dr. Walsh is the Chief Global Strategy and AI Officer at Levi Strauss and & Company. And today, she shares how her team has leveraged a mindset of think big, start small, scale fast, to create cutting edge data models and digital capabilities quickly. The Data Chief is presented by our friends at ThoughtSpot, the modern analytics cloud company. ThoughtSpot makes it easy for anyone to analyze your company's data with search and AI. Business people from companies like Walmart, Hulu, Schneider Electric, Cloud Academy, and Mercado use ThoughtSpot to quickly uncover new insights and turn them into action. You can learn more at ThoughtSpot.com. Katia, welcome to the Data Chief. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, normally I ask where are you joining from, but I first have to comment on the beautiful Levi's jacket, and I'm guessing Levi's jeans that you're sporting today. Always Levi's all the time. Well, maybe Except should... the t-shirt today is a Data Chief t-shirt. Oh, I love it. Our, our swag people will love to hear that, and hopefully everyone will hop over to YouTube and actually take, take a look to see if you're speaking truth there. But where are you joining us from today, Katia? I'm joining from the Bay Area where I live with my husband, son, and a cat. And a cat. Okay. So fellow cat lovers, fellow cat lovers and data lovers. And as we dive into data, you know, you, ha you have an incredible role at Levi Strauss. Tell us a little bit about that role. Levi Strauss and company pioneered a role that fuses strategy, digital data and AI capabilities all in one in the C-suite. It was the first in the apparel retail industry, but it was also the first company across many different industries to do what is likely to come for many others in the future. It, it is um, a pioneering role. And sometimes I would see this blend of roles in digital natives, startup companies. Um, tell us a little bit about why this comprehensive role was created and how it helps inform the customer journey at Levi Strauss. Levi's has always been on the forefront of innovation. Um, it was one of the first companies in the United States to file for patents. It literally invented the category that it still leads to this day. And it also stands for a lot of impact in the world, even beyond its immediate industry. The role that it created is one that's meant to penetrate with impact the entirety of the organization. And of course, serving our consumers and customers is always the key priority, but it's not only meant to serve the customer experience. It is meant to be a capability that positions Levi Strauss and company for its next 200 years. Yeah, so that's pretty bold. And I know that it has a measurable impact. Some of what you're working on is bleeding edge in AI, or let's say leading edge. Even last week, you were interviewed, an article came out about how AI is doing things to drive pricing optimization. Can you elaborate on that? Certainly, I heard two questions actually in this one. One is about use cases and the other one is about how we apply 
um, this capability at Levi Strauss and Company. Uh, let me start with uh, dispelling a bit of a fallacy. Um, we are at this point in time well beyond use cases when we build a capability that combines uh, all the competencies around digital, data and artificial intelligence in one single cohesive capability. It is not about coming up with use cases to prove its value. Uh, the world has moved beyond that in the last decade. Every company today is a data and tech company, whether it realizes it or not. So uh, to bring that in the context of Levi Strauss and company, we are building this capability to serve the entirety of the enterprise, uh, always starting with the customer experience. Uh, of course, we also want to make sure that we bring that capability to serve our internal efficiency and operations and to also position the company for the future as a differentiated competitor and a leader in the category. We talk about using digital data and AI as a capability to create three smarter Cs. One, smarter connections with our consumers. Two, smarter commerce. And three, smarter creation, which is the essence of a company like Levi Strauss. Okay, so so the three C's, I think that's a great takeaway. But you also disagreed with me about creating value. So I have to I have to debate this because even this week in the Data Chief Slack community, I had a data leader asking, how do you even measure the ROI? How do you justify investments here? So maybe while Levi Strauss has moved past this, I would say there are some organizations that are struggling to articulate it. So is it is it that we just are trying to come up with an ROI on something that really should be the cost and the way of doing business? Or what do you think? Is this laggards? Well, how couldn't you justify investment in what is the essence of a modern business? A modern yeah. business cannot exist and thrive without having a viable and thriving capability around digital and emerging technologies. We are now starting to look at quantum, actually, that will become a bit more and more stable and at some point will be a part of a modern business as well. Uh, data, of course, and artificial intelligence and everything in between. There's no business today that can survive without it. So to those companies that haven't seen the light quite yet, they will. The question is, would it be too late for them? Yeah. No. Oh, oh, yes. Okay. So would it be too late? So you and I are totally aligned here. Somebody recently asked me, what is the digital economy? And I said, it is the economy. That is the economy. Um, but maybe it's also connecting those dots that it, maybe organizations who have digitized, they're capturing the data, but are they fully exploiting it and leveraging it? It depends on the company. Um, Obviously, I would say that no company today is fully using the vast richness of data that we have coming at us. And this is where the definition of data comes to play. Data is all around us. This podcast, because it is being recorded, is data. The um, images from a video camera, whether it's in a store or somewhere on the street or someone's phone, they are data. The data flowing from sensors on delivery trucks, on vending machines, even on animals as part of Internet of Things um, trends. They are farm animals right now where artificial intelligence is being used to increase productivity, for example. Everything from that is data. Uh, I started my career as a journalist uh, many years ago at this point, but that was a way of gathering data. Journalists make fantastic data scientists because they gather data, they identify patterns, and they make that available to the world to see. Um, so everything around us is data. You cannot stop data and you can never fully use what is the essence of our world. 
Yeah, so well said. And the breath that you described, um, you you mentioned chips in farm animals. I'm picturing chips in the lost pets as well. So you and I are aligned on how much data is being created. Let, let's go back to the three C's that you referred to and maybe tie together this vast array of data that you're using. Um, so maybe picture me, Cindy, going to the store because I do still go to a store <laughs> or shopping online and I'm looking for that perfect pair of 501 light blue denim jeans. What are the different data sources that you bring together to make that happen? So first of all, great choice. 501 is one of our <laughs> iconic um, uh, iconic products, but of course, Levi Strauss and company makes a lot more than 501s and a lot more than jeans. We have fantastic tops for women. We have um, amazing tracker jackets, accessories. Um, it is um, not easy to make a choice. Uh, so you should be going to stores as well. All of our consumers are actually using anything that is convenient for them. And that's exactly where we want to be. We want to be where our consumers are. So let's take the question that you asked about how our consumers experience Levi's. And the answer to that is that for Levi's consumers, it's not business. It's all personal. And it starts with the web experience. When you go to our website, levi.com, uh, everything would be personalized depending, of course, on what we know about our consumers, always shared with explicit permissions. You cannot delight consumers if you don't first protect them. But once we have that permission and we have information about browsing behaviors, preferences, needs, etc., then everything that a consumer experiences on the website is relevant to them. When they go to the search um, button, what they see as results, uh, what will be elevated at the top would be what's most relevant to them. The product recommendations, the filter categories are absolutely relevant and personalized to them. Even when they start uh, with the actual purchasing behavior and put products in a cart, in-cart product recommendations are also personalized. But that's something that everyone does today. So we don't see that as necessarily differentiating. One of the things that we do see as differentiating for our web experience is that we also now offer, it just started, it's very new, a visual search. This is where a consumer can go to the site and upload a photo of something that they've liked, whether it was at the Oscars uh, uh, a few weeks ago or, um, I know that you have a daughter who recently left college, Cindy, if she saw a friend and liked what they were wearing, she can actually take a photo of, of her friend's outfit, upload it on the site, and the site using computer vision will serve the exact products that Levi's has in our vast product portfolio that match what the photo has. And then whether it's your daughter or yourself, you could go through the rest of the journey and purchase the item right then and there. Now okay. that is truly differentiating and it's a very active way of personalizing the experience. But that's just the web experience. So let's take an example of going to the store. When you go to a store, it used to be that our stores had pretty much the same assortment. And if it were different before COVID, it might be uh, somewhat fitted towards the traffic that you would see from consumers in that particular city, whether it was more of a tourist store, um, for example, in New York, or a bit more catering to local residents. COVID changed that and AI changed that. So when our consumers go to stores from now on, they actually experience very customized assortments to the specific profile of consumers who shop in that vicinity and frequent that location. Uh, and we have this tale of two cities, for example, in the country of Italy, Milan and Rome, two cities not far from each other, used to have the same assortments, not anymore. Even the minuscule differences in temperature in the weather between the two cities 
um, has determined that we must have different assortments in the two cities stores. So in Milan, you would find a little bit longer sleeves, more, more trousers that are longer, not so many shorts. In Rome, you would find um, more shorts and uh, weather, weather specific warm clothes for warmer uh, weather. But it doesn't stop there. Even in the Rome location itself, you would find different assortments depending on whether you're in the city of Rome or in the suburbs because the consumers who frequent those locations and stores are vastly different from each other. They're younger, a little bit less wealthy in the uh, suburban location, although Levi's is a very democratic brand, so we always make everything available in our portfolio. But we also want to make sure that an entry level product like our T-shirts are available where our younger consumers really want and need them. And then in the city of Rome itself, you would also find some premium categories and products because uh, of the type of population that lives in the city. And finally, one other example how it is all personal for Levi's consumers, um, it is the loyalty program that we have. So no two Levi's consumers are the same. Why should the rewards that we offer in our loyalty program be the same? And we use more data than we have ever had in the past and apply machine learning to that data to ensure that we provide an exclusive, fully individualized benefit for each of our individual loyalty program members, millions of those that they are around the world. And the United States alone, we have 5.3 million loyalty program members. So one loyalty program member who is into music would get access to concert tickets. Another loyalty program member who is into uh, fashion trends would get early access to our collaboration. And as another example, a third loyalty program member who is really into getting personal attention would might get a person, personal styling session in a store. These are just some examples of how for Levi's consumers, it is not business, it's all personal. And in fact, we turn these consumers into fans around the yeah. world for an iconic <laughs> brand like Levi's. Well, so yeah, now I'm thinking I'm more than a consumer, a fan, because I can't wait to take a picture, not of my daughter's jeans, my neighbor's jeans. And I want to upload that and see what you come back and recommend to me. So this is, this is a lot, Katya. So you have new data types, the vision, computer vision, that is differentiated using that to personalize. And then you talked about um, Milan and Rome. And, and yes, I've been to both these cities. And so I can picture the weather differences. And I picture then the new data types that you're bringing in, whether everyone has been, but um, the, the dew points, the human mobility, and for the personalization, the new data types that you're using, this, this is a lot of different data. So how do you decide where to start? What data will help deliver a more personalized experience? Do you start with um, what's out there and what you know? Or how do you even begin to bring the vast array of external data to bear? Thank you, for, first of all, for summarizing and recapping the, the way in which we provide smarter connections with our consumers through this combination of digital data and artificial intelligence capabilities. So to your question about how we start, it, it's not about the data. It's really about driving desired outcomes. Just like the world has moved beyond proving the need for use cases uh, and to building capabilities, uh, <laughs> We are now in, uh, living at a time when it's not even anymore about data-driven decisions. Of course, we have to make data-driven decisions. That is a given. Again, that's the table stakes. But we need to move be beyond that into driving desired outcomes. Uh, and this is where uh, there's a motto that I found tremendously helpful in my career and certainly applying it uh, to my experience at Levi's as well. And that is think big start small and scale fast. It's a very practical approach, but it's also incredibly transformative 
because it does start with the think big part. You have to paint that big vision. At a company like Levi Strauss, we have a tremendous opportunity and we are doing exactly that. We are taking an iconic brand. It is truly a privilege to be a custodian of that brand and extending and amplifying the power of that brand throughout the world. Uh, creating these smarter connections with our consumers, smarter commerce and smarter creation. And I'll talk about those other two as well uh, for the in our conversation. So that's the vision. But then you have to start in a very practical way and deliver value pretty quickly. So it's not about the perfect data. It's about the problems that we can solve quickly and show value. And this is where there's another fallacy that I'm going to dispel. There's this fallacy that you have to build a foundation. There is this comparison to building a house. You have to start with the foundation and then you have to build the first floor and maybe there's a second floor and then you put the windows. That is wrong. By the time you've gotten there, the world would have moved on. CFOs would have lost their patience about seeing results. And that's where, um, you know, the few examples of not so successful transformations uh, would come into play. Instead, the better analogy, not the only one, but the more accurate analogy would be about creating a business. You're starting a business. You will not get it right. You will not get it perfect. Data is never perfect. But you have to start somewhere. And this is where having an investment portfolio approach really helps. We want to make sure we focus on both transformative capabilities that may take a little bit longer to materialize and at the same time also quick wins so that we show that value and gain momentum and once you gain momentum you gain champions and once you gain champions you gain a following it becomes a movement throughout the enterprise and you no longer have to do it yourself you do it together as a whole company Yes. So you and I agree on this, um, you know, think big or I say dream big, but start small. The foundation, though, I'm picturing all the many data architects sitting out there thinking, no, 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 no. We, we do need clean data. And maybe they're in a different uh, sector. Maybe they're in a highly regulated sector. Um, how How do you have these quick wins and get to a good enough foundation, a small enough foundation to build on that? So let, there are two things here. One, you will never get clean and perfect data. The world is messy and data is just a reflection on our world. Let me repeat what I said earlier. You cannot stop data. By definition, if you're trying to make it clean, you have to stop it. That's just not possible. It's a tsunami of data. Let's go back to our definition of data. Images, sensors, pictures, social media posts, purchases, abandoned cards, behaviors. You know, we live in this tremendous world and time of data coming at us all the time. You can never stop data. What you can do though, is make sure, and I have worked in regulated industries, so I have that experience to tell you about it. You can decide what data has to be trusted, reliable for reporting purposes. This is a f just a fraction, a tiny fraction of the data that is usually high value and high risk. And so for that data, we must have the discipline to identify it, to harness it, and to make sure that we have the consistency and manage it appropriately. But again, that is only a fraction of our data. So again, if we think about think big, get all the data you want, start small, corral the small fraction of data that has to be the same and trusted and reliable, usually for reporting purposes, usually to regulators, and also so you can manage your business. But don't worry about the rest of it, because as we solve problems in real time, we will also make sure we get the data at the same time to apply it in our work, but usually in machine learning. So 
One very compelling example is, you know, I joined Levi Strauss and company just a few months before the pandemic started. On the one hand, it was very challenging. On the other hand, it was really an opportunity to show quickly the value of what this capability can achieve. So picture, you know, March through June of 2020, global company, we could learn from what was starting to happen in China, then in Europe and in the US. So we had that advantage. Mm -hmm. um, but we also faced times when a proportion of our stores in various parts of the world would be closed. What our competitors did, they were facing piles of mounting inventory in their stores that were also closed. We did not do that. We got all the data that we could gather. It wasn't perfect. We were cleaning it as we were starting to solve the problem. And the problem we were looking to solve was what should we price our products at such a challenging and some would say unpredictable time. Competitors were discounting on mass, but we did not want to do that. The Levi's brand is very strong around the world. And when we gathered data and created price elasticity models and applied machine learning, we realized that consumers in most cases would pay full price because of the strength of the brand. This is an example of that pricing optimization that I think you mentioned earlier. And because we did that, we were able to not discount, to charge full price and also get to consumers what they needed when they needed that. So it was truly a win-win and it helped us emerge from the crisis that we all faced even healthy as a company than we have been before. Did we wait for the perfect data? No. Did we wait for even the perfect models? No. Did we make sure that we solved the problem right when we needed it? Yes, absolutely. And we do this all the time across the company. Yeah, so that's a, that's a lot to impact. Pricing optimization in retail to that degree certainly is new, let's say, newer. Of course, we've had it in airlines or what have you. Um, and then your point about building the foundation, I, I think you're right that organizations historically treated all data the same with the same rigidity of governance rather than thinking about what's high risk and what's no time to market is more important. So um, I think those are good key principles to take away from that. You know, you also, so you do have an interesting background, spending some time in, in finance, in financial services, spending some time in telco as well, but you started um, way back as a journalist. How do you think this has helped you in getting people comfortable with data and maybe the ideas of data storytelling? I love your questions. They're very deep questions, Cindy. Um, <laughs> they, ca they cause me to pause and, and think through them because in this one question, um, you're asking me one about how I started, two about what the value of that background is, and three about uh, the importance of communication and storytelling. And yes, they're all important. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, journalists make fantastic data scientists because of training in terms of gathering and processing all kinds of information as human beings and then identifying patterns and communicating that to the world, which is no easy task. Uh, and that is something that I have found uh, very helpful. And it has certainly uh, assisted me as I've gone through various companies around the world in different industries and have done my best to communicate what this capability that combines digital data and AI competencies can deliver for companies and then making it happen. So communication is really important there. But another revelation from this background is that people in this field can come from all walks of life and backgrounds. Usually, traditionally, the path has been 
from engineering. And that is a great path as well. But what we also know is that there's no single path. Yes, journalists also make fantastic data scientists. Yes, physicists make great data scientists, chemists, social scientists, ethicists. Um, but what I've also realized is that there's not one single background. It's really about the mindset of problem solving, curiosity, and lifelong learning. And once we had this revelation, we actually applied that at Levi Strauss and Company to train employees around the world in machine learning. Will all of them become data scientists? No, but they have now become champions of this culture around digital transformation. They speak the language, they translate it when necessary, and they're tackling old problems that we could not quite solve in the past in new ways because we've now given them the tools to do that. We have people who come from design, people who manage stores, stylists, people in finance, in HR that are now trained in Python and machine learning and agile ways of working. And they are the biggest champions of digital transformation throughout the world of Levi's. Okay, so Katya, I'm noticing you do this too. I review, <laughs> I try to dig deeper and then you take the question further. So I started with your unique background and you came back to other people's backgrounds. So I have to say, I read about the boot camp that Levi Strauss recently launched that, I, again, I, I, I think it's fabulous. So share a little bit more about this and the um, maybe why you did it and the makeup of the first cohort. Yes, yeah, so what we did in the past year, it's very recent, is we, we took 101 people out of their day jobs for eight weeks and we put them in a virtual online bootcamp. It is called Bootcamp for a reason. It is not a summer camp. It is very intense. It's a lot of hands-on work. Uh, we had 450 applications from employees throughout the globe. Uh, we had people in 24 different locations. None of them was required to have any previous experience in coding or statistics, but we did put all candidates through a rigorous selection process. While it was a very democratic process, we wanted to make sure that everyone had the opportunity to um, experience this bootcamp. It was open to all. It's not really for all because it requires a certain way of thinking. So we tested uh, with rigor for problem solving, for curiosity, for perseverance and resilience, because as you know, Cindy, and all of you in the audience know too, it is not easy to work in this field. You can't just give up. You have to always pursue alternative avenues to solve a problem. So we were deliberately looking for persistence and grit, you know, passion and perseverance. And we put those um, finally selected people in two classes. We graduated 40 three in the spring of 2021. I'm very happy to say that two thirds of that first class were women, which is not usual for this field. <laughs> uh, we then had a second class in the fall of 2021. I'm very happy to say that half of that class were people who identified themselves as black and indigenous people of color, which is also not usual for this field. So while it has been a great way to add to our skill set and to our digital transformation, it has also become a great way to add diversity into this field within the company. And as we speak, we'll be launching our third class, we call them cohorts, in the spring of this year, and then we we'll have a fourth one in the fall of this year as well. Yeah, Katia, I think there are some huge points in that. Besides just what was the makeup of the graduating people from these boot camps, it's that you also assessed not just the key skills they walked in with, but the aptitude and grit and resilience, I think, 
when you're trying to transform an organization, an industry to drive change is huge. I'm going to bet many organizations don't do that. Well, I can't speak to other organizations, but I'm very happy to be at Levi's at this point in time. Um, it has always been a company of tremendous values. Um, in fact, Levi Strauss, our founder himself, created a scholarship for 12 people back in the 19th century, Cindy. And out of the 12, he gave half, six scholarships to women. This was at a time when women could not even vote anywhere in the world, including in the United States. And Levi Strauss did that. So this is what Levi's has always done. It is in line with our values. And in this time of digital transformation, we continue to do so because it's the right thing to do, but also because diversity is particularly important in this field. We have to do our very best to minimize bias one can never completely eliminate bias in life. Sadly, I know that because my doctoral dissertation was about uh, how we minimize bias as an example. However, it, we owe it to the world and it is the responsibility of all of us in this field to do our very best to apply data and AI in a socially responsible and ethical way, which includes minimizing bias. And the diversity is key to that. Diversity of people, diversity of data, as we spoke earlier, and diversity of tools. Yeah, so it sounds like you already have this culture that is forward thinking. And yes, every professional in this space, we have to be looking at ways to minimize bias using all the different levers. You know, Katya, we are both so fortunate to work in a fast paced industry, but maybe how do you personally stay up to date with all the latest trends? What do you read? Who do you listen to and when? So I learned from everyone. Um, I hopefully I'm humble enough to know that I have a lot to learn. And the more I learn, the more I realize I have more to learn. Uh, but the bootcamp graduates that I just mentioned earlier, are actually people that I learn from all the time. And I'll give you an example here as well. I talked about the three C's and we covered the smarter connections with consumers. And we also covered an example of smarter commerce, our cutting edge work in pricing optimization. Um, we have now started to create uh, or to deliver smarter creation. And the pioneer of that work at Levi's was actually a machine learning bootcamp graduate. He was in design in our design organization before he joined. He was not a computer scientist at all. I think he had taken maybe one class before the bootcamp, but because he was so interested in it, he qualified for our advanced classroom. And during the bootcamp, he realized that he could do something quite revolutionary in this field. He developed a neural network that would take thousands of images from art. He chose Van Gogh and would superimpose those images on some of the iconic Levi's products, including the Levi's iconic tracker jacket. I happen to be wearing one now at yeah. the moment. And as a result of this work, we now have an AI inspired Van Gogh Starry Night Trucker jacket. And I learned that from a machine learning bootcamp graduate as part of our smarter creation. I love that. It's such a great story, the way this person could apply their skills cross-functionally and grow. I, also, I always like to end with maybe one last piece of inspiration, if you're willing, Katya. Um, if you think about what, it's been a tough year, a tough few years for so many people, but what are you most grateful for? It has been a tough two years and it's continues to be tough. So I do have to start with what you would call the obvious, but you cannot take it for granted. I am grateful for health. Um, you cannot take that for granted, especially given that we had faced a global pandemic and continue to do so. 
I'm also grateful for peace where you and I happen to be, Cindy, because that is not the case around the world. Um, and it's something that absolutely keeps me at night, keeps me up at night. And I'm grateful for people. I'm grateful for the kindness of people, uh, which does shine in challenging times like the past few years. I'm grateful for the people that I work with, whether they're people on my team who give me tremendous energy. And again, I don't take for granted. And they could be the machine learning bootcamp graduates that I mentioned, or people throughout the company in many different functions. You cannot lead a transformation alone. It does take a village. It takes an entire company to take itself to the next 200 years. And so I am very grateful for people throughout Levi's and beyond. So beautifully said, Katya. I'm so grateful that the Data Chief podcast has connected us. Thank you for being on the Data Chief. I'm honored and thank you, Cindy, for leading this important work for our entire community.